I, for one, have absolutely no musical talent. Can't sing, can't dance. What I can do, though, is play board games with a musical theme, and I've done just that on the channel with Ovation. I've done it solo, I've unboxed it, I've taught it. Now I'm going to tell you how I think it goes. Set up here for Ovation. So you are going to shuffle each of the four decks separately, make a display of five cards for each deck. You're going to grab a number of Maestro cards equal to the number of players plus two. Put those up there. You're going to shuffle up the ticket cards and put them so everyone can reach them. You're going to create a supply of music notes. Each player is going to get a player board, their player piece in that color, one musical note, one of each inspiration put at the one spot. And if you're playing with the Magnum Opus module, you'll give them their three Magnum Opus cards. To play the game, you're going to be taking actions at the top of your board. After you do the actions, you will trigger cards above them based on how many musical notes you have. And you'll be going back and forth until two of these are remaining. The four actions are, first one is seek inspiration. This is you can move up two of your inspirations one spot or one of your inspirations two spots. Seek fortune. You are going to buy one of the fortune cards. The cost to buy them is at the bottom. This is a mixture of any of the inspirations. So this one needs two, this one needs one, this one needs four. You can spend the inspiration like so and then grab one of them. There is an icon in this upper corner here that is going to denote which action it goes under. So if I choose to buy this one, this would slide under my board under the Seek Inspiration. You are going to refill the market at the end of your turn. Seek Patronage is going to be very similar to Seek Fortune, except you're going to seek Pay one of these patrons. Their cost, again, is denoted at the bottom. However, there are two different types of patrons. This first patron is going to be looking for sorrowful music and doesn't like joyful music. So if you purchase this patron, you're going to put them to the side of their board and then you'll be scoring legacy points, which are end game points, based on his likes and dislikes at the end of the game. The other type of patron you have goes under your seek fortune slot and then gives you a bonus so if we would have spent our one we would put this person under our seek fortune like this it'd be the end of our turn and we would flip over the last action you can do is you can perform when you perform you're going to choose either chamber music or concert music based on what you can afford and then you will be performing it by spending the specific colored icons underneath each composer has a special ability that will relate to when they perform. So Hayden's is, I can spend one less inspiration for any concert music. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at these cards. So this is the basic one. This is chamber music. Again, this is the cost. Three passion, two joy. It's going to be five points. This is piano music. And then this would be considered a passion music. The opera requires you to have a passion music already performed. So if you had already performed this, you'd be eligible to do this one. This again costs three passion and two joy. This will be an opera, again, a passion music, and then end of game points. So we'll just imagine I had enough to say do this piano duet. I would grab the piano duet. I would then ask everyone else if they would like to attend my concert. You're going to ask the person to your left and to your right. For each person who does, they are going to draw a ticket and give it to you, and then they are going to get the symbol that is listed here. So in this instance, they would get one blue. In the instance of this opera here, they would get a yellow and a red, and you now have this ticket card. The ticket card is part of a free action. If you have two tickets that show the yellow icon on it, you can discard both of them to push up your yellow one spot. Otherwise, every two tickets, regardless of symbol, are gonna be one point at the end of the game. And in addition to performing the music, you also now have another music note, which will allow you to trigger more cards. 
Jumping ahead to this point, I want to kind of show you how you trigger and do the engine building and move around on the board. So I've kind of set up a mock board. You may not get to this level, but I just want to kind of show you what one of the big turns may look like. So I'll have five pieces of music. So one of the free actions is you can claim a maestro card. So I claimed that because I have five pieces of music. So once one more is claimed, and the game will be triggered, and that'll be equal number of turns. So on my turn, let's say I go to perform. So now I can perform. I'm going to look out here, and my card here shows that if I perform a woodwind, I can then take a fortune action. So we are going to perform this woodwind trio. We spend our four. We grab the woodwind trio. We ask, does anyone want to attend? They say no. We get one more musical note. We are then going to put the musical note on here. Now this lets me take the fortune action. So we move my piece over here. In order to trigger the stuff above, you need to do the action. So now I can do a fortune action. Well, I'm just gonna grab, spend one to grab this one right here. This goes under the perform. I now can spend these. I'm going to spend this to get a plus one yellow. I'm going to put this here, which will let me move over to seek inspiration. So now I can seek my inspiration. I'm going to move my red up and my blue. Looking up here, what these symbols mean with the arrow is I need to have moved these up on the track this turn. So I did move my red. So that gives me an additional red. So now I have two options. I can trigger my blue which will let me come back to Seek Fortune. Instead, I am going to trigger this one. I moved up my red. This allows me to go over to Seek Patronage. So now I can Seek a Patron. We're gonna look out here and based on it, I don't want him. So let's just, for example, spend our three to grab him, which puts him under Fortune. I can now spend this to move back to Seek Inspiration which I can say, you know what, let's move up that one and move up that one. And then because I have this left and I have performed this and my blue has moved up, I technically could jump over here to seek fortune and get another fortune card. And then if I had a musical note, I could jump over to perform again and so forth. So that is the big chaining actions you can get. And then I'd look, I have spent five musical notes in one turn, which means I would claim that one. Triggering the end of the game, I was first player, so my opponent would have one more shot. So there are three free actions in the game. I've already gone over the one of grabbing the maestro card. The second is you can permanently discard a music note to wipe any of the rows. So let me just refill these. So I discard that and we'll say I wasn't a fan of these patrons. So we discard this and then deal out five new cards. And the third one I also already went over is if you have two of the same colored tickets, you can discard those to push yourself up one on the track. At the end of the game, you are going to score points for all of your performed music, points on your cards up here, points on your collected maestro cards, and then every two tickets, regardless of symbol on the other side, are going to be a point. Most points wins the game. So that is how you play Ovation. All right, so there you go. That is kind of how you play Ovation. So let's get into what I think of it. And first thing we're going to talk about, of course, is inside the box. If you want to see a detailed video on that, you can check the link up above to where I unboxed the game and showed you everything that is inside. So as for what I think of all those components... I really love the thematic player boards. They're double layer. They look like the piano keys that you just move them around. It was a really nice design element that they didn't have to get thematic. They could have gave you a plain old player board and been like, all right, there, there's your player board. But just that little touch right there of adding that thematic element to it really, really made it shine and really made it something that fit well and immersed you into the game. The musical notes, again, they could have just done little black cubes to trigger stuff just to kind of, you know, be done with it. But no, they made they went that extra mile. They made the little musical notes that you'll use. So again, really trying to do a thematic production as opposed to just a game production. 
They wanted to go with that real, those elements that are really going to suck you into the theme. The cards also, they're well done. The text that you need to know is big. The little icons for your inspiration up on top, all of that. The fortune cards have big on there. The action you're going to be taking. The music cards, if you look on the back, will have like the color and symbols along the back. So that way you can easily tell two at a glance. And it just, instead of just having this drab card background, adding that touch of color, adding those other elements to it. And touching on that, the fact that each inspiration is a different color, but also a different shape. So that way they are easily discernible to all as well. I will say as much as I do like the player boards and all that, when you start tucking in the cards behind it, and especially if you start getting one in each action slot, it does get crowded because it's like just enough space for four of them. So sometimes you have to kind of space them out a little bit so they're not directly above it because once they're all there, you're almost right into each other and starting to overlap. The rule book itself is good too. It taught the game fairly well. My one gripe with it is it was kind of like the end of the game and then you get legacy points and then here's kind of where you did. I kind of would have preferred like end game, end game scoring. You want to total up your points from here, from here, from here, from here, from here. And they kind of just like, you're going to get legacy points from various places. You're going to go from here and maybe here and then here and here. It just, it looked weird in where it was and how it was laid out. Almost kind of more like it was an afterthought. They put it in and hoped to get back to it. Never did. I honestly don't know if that's what happened, but it just, it looked out of place with how the rest of the rule book was presented and written. All right, so on to the two-player experience for the game. The main differences in the two-player game is there's less maestro cards because you put them out based on player count. I'm pretty sure it was player count plus two. So you have less maestro cards, but again, you also have less people going for them, so it works out there. And that when you perform, normally you'd ask your person left and right if they want to come, so you could be getting two tickets possibly. In a two-player game, you are only getting the one ticket. So that does kind of hinder that like scoring or the usability of those because, you know, if you do one performance and both people tend, you could luck out and get two matching tickets, which can automatically jumpstart your inspiration again. But by only having the one, you have to do like two performances until you get two. So the ticket cards, they didn't seem as valuable per se or as much of an incentive in a two-player game. In addition to that, as is most cases when you have a, you know, a display or decks of cards or so forth in a two-player game, they don't necessarily rotate out as much as in a multiplayer game when more people are buying them. So the market does seem to get stagnant at times and kind of like just force you to buy cards just to get them out of the market. Yes, you can spend one of your music symbols to reset the market, but those music symbols are so helpful in triggering all of your various actions you don't really want to keep giving them up. So talking about gameplay, this is one of those games that it's easy to explain, but hard to master or hard to play well, because it literally is, you know, just take one of these four actions and that could trigger something. Done. But sometimes it's, you know, you're triggering this action, or you go here and then this triggers you to move over here, which can trigger this, which will kick you over to here and over to there. So be able to see all of those steps is where it gets hard and does get complicated. And then having to remember that you need to take the action again, just because you've already taken the action once this turn, doesn't mean you can go back to like seek fortune and just trigger stuff. You are going to have to buy a fortune card again. So trying to be able to maintain the mentality of, you know, I'm gonna get this and come over here and now I'm gonna trigger this, but do I wanna go back there? Cause am I gonna have enough resources to do what I wanna do? and still buy this card? Or is there gonna be a card out there that I can afford when I go back there? For us, it was an engine builder, but it felt like a little bit of a slower engine builder than we're used to, and the engine wasn't readily presented. Like the engine more so was like, do this to get over to the Seek Inspiration. The Seek Inspiration can take you somewhere else to maybe bring it back to that Seek Inspiration. So some of those, or the fact that like the performability to trigger move over to places a lot of times was contingent on you doing a specific type of music, either like the woodwind or the piano or so forth. So if those aren't out there, if that's not something you're really wanting to do to further on the goal, then it's almost like a wasted card in the engine. So for it being an engine builder, it's not as clear, it's not as quick, and it's not as easy to get your engine up and going and running all of the time. And sometimes that is a luck of the draw. 
There was one game where Brian and I played where I lucked into a lot of the good cards, had it. So I was doing my engine. I was like performing and then moving around and then basically having enough inspiration again to be able to perform again and just left her in the dust. So sometimes it's the luck of the draw and sometimes if the person doesn't plan right or doesn't get it set up right and moving quick enough, they can get left in the dust in this one because that one person can just keep performing all the music and taking and getting both maestro cards and they barely moved forward. And also with that straightforward, or that not being straightforward engine building, this could lead to either like AP or slow turns, as it's not going to be simply like do this, blah, 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 go. It's the whole people sometimes have to walk through like, all right, I did this, and now I'm going to move these. Now what do I need for this? All right, now I'm going to move here. So it's a more methodical, slower, almost plotting movement through it up for some people, especially if they don't have the ability to plan those four or five steps ahead of knowing, you know, if I go here, that's gonna move me here. I know what car I'm gonna get that. And then you can just go. The other person might actually have to like walk through, all right, what do I have now to be able to forward stuff? All right. So if they can't get their head around it, that is going to slow up the gameplay. So overall, we enjoyed it, even though it did move a little slow for us and it did take Bri a little bit longer to get her engine going a lot of times. As I said, there was one game where she was slow with it. I was quick. So that one wasn't as enjoyable for her, but there are some games where we were kind of neck and neck because the right cards weren't coming out to really trigger things. But yeah, it is. it can take some people a little bit longer to really process on how, where and how they want to place things and what cards are optimal and be able to afford those cards when they come out. I also do like that the end game is constantly progressing with those Maestro cards unless you are actively not trying to take that music. A lot of times those maestro cards do cover a fairly large array, and it does state in the rule book, you know, if you fulfill a maestro card, you have to take it. You can't just be like, no, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna wait, just to extend the game. It's like, nope, take that maestro card, let's get this game going. And in regards to those though, that can make it where the end game does come quick, especially if you end up having maestro cards that overlap or the right music comes out to overlap. Like if you need to get like four sorrow music and four piano music and there's like three piano music out there with sorrow on it, then that's going to, you're, you're going to do three of them and you're already three fourths of the way to the next goal. And also with those, like if you have the right composer, that sometimes helps as well. In my solo play, we had to do sorrow, sorrowful music. Well, the character I play gives me a sorrow disc, sorrow inspiration discount when I perform, so it's able, to, so I'm able to get those quicker and easier because I don't have to have as much sorrow as the other players. Also, not a huge fan of the solo mode for the AI. It does do a lot of upkeep. As I said, I had the solo play. I'll link that up above. There was a lot of upkeep for it, a lot of thinking of it. It's almost like you are playing two-handed at times. And so it's harder for me to really focus on my strategy, figure out what I'm doing, keep my mentality here, because I'm using so much mental power running the AI. You know, when it does the best action, all right, which cards does it have? Now trigger all that. And then when it gets music, it's like, all right, well, it's going down this row, and then it's going to look for legacy points based on who it has as a patron. And there's just so much thought process needed for that AI player that by the time you get to your, your board, you're trying to remember what was I working on, where am I going, how am I doing. So it's almost like a reset every time you're going to it, and that really slowed me down and hindered my thought process. I'm not a fan of the solo play. So with all of that, I am going to say that it go, okay, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10. It's one that we will grab off the shelf if we're in the mood for that type of game, that type of engine builder, that type of theme. But we have engine builder games or those types of games where you collect stuff to turn stuff in that play quicker and smoother and don't slog down as much with someone trying to maneuver around that you can see that engine building. So for us, that's why I think it's only okay, a 6 out of 10. Again, it's not one that we're going to get rid of. It's one that we did enjoy and that we do like playing, especially the components and the thematic elements. So, again, that's how it go. Now, if you could please go down below and hit like, subscribe, comment, share, ring the bell for this video and this channel, especially if this is a review that you enjoyed. There is also a thing we have going on down there, a Kofi, where you can help support the channel by buying me a drink and we can toast to my review of Ovation and go, applaud, applaud, applaud. 
So that is it for this one. So until the next one, ding, 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 da, dong, da, 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 dong, dong, dong.